Hi everyone, I'm Chris Grutz, Executive and Artistic Director at the Annenberg Center. I want to welcome you to our event today, Dance, Romance, and Gender Fluidity, an Aviva film discussion with Deb Thomas and Mayori Holmes. This is our part of Arts and Culture at Homecoming during the 2020 Homecoming at Home week. I'm glad you could be with us. I'm pleased to introduce Mayori Holmes, the Annenberg Center's Curator at Large for Film and a media maker in residence at the Annenberg School for Communications. Mayori is a curator, filmmaker, and writer, and she's the founder, founder of Black Star Film Festival, uh, which started in 2012. She also serves as its artistic director and CEO. Mayori is a 2019 Soros Equity Fellow and a creative executive with Blackbird. I'm also pleased to introduce Deb Thomas, the R. Jean Brownlee Professor of Anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania and director of Center for, the Center for Experimental Ethnography. Deb is the author of Political Life in the Wake of the Plantation, Exceptional Violence, and Modern Blackness. Deb co-directed the documentary films Bad Friday and Four Days in May, and she is the co-curator of a multimedia installation entitled Bearing Witness, Four Days in West Kingston. Prior to her life in the Academy, Deb was a professional dancer with the company Urban Bushwomen. Today, Deb and Maori will be discussing the film Aviva, by director Boaz Yakin. We're really excited to include this film in the fall 2020 film series that the Annenberg Center recently launched with support from our colleagues in the Annenberg School for Communications, the Provost's Office, and the Executive Vice President's Office. The Annenberg started presenting film in the 1970s and has a long history of presenting international, culturally diverse, and innovative independent film. So we're really proud to revitalize this tradition and we're pleased to provide some context for you today around the film Aviva. I think you'll enjoy the discussion and we encourage you to participate, posting your questions directly for Mayori and Deb. Thanks again for being with us. I hope you enjoy all the arts and culture events this week and we'll see you back on campus as soon as we're able. Thanks again. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Mayori. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for um, joining us. Um, my name is Mayori Holmes, and Chris just introduced me. And, uh, and I'm Deborah Thomas, and Chris introduced me as well. Yeah. Um, so I'll get us started and talk a little bit about why I chose this film, and then um, you know we can get into it. And also, I want to encourage those of you in the audience: if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and. Um, we'll respond to them. But partly what I was thinking about when selecting films for this semester overall, um, you know, Chris and I had a lot of plans for what we would do at Annenberg before COVID. <laughs> and um, also just to be clear, I, I started this position in March. So I had two weeks before we knew that sort of nothing was going to happen. Um, and so um, we started thinking about what might be possible in a virtual space, um, which was a little bit different. And so I just wanted to choose films that I thought the Annenberg audience would be interested in in content because of the kinds of performances that have happened at the center. And so this film in particular, having so many, um, having dance as so central to its structure seemed like it would appeal to the kinds of uh, companies that have performed at Annenberg and that are kind of core to the audience. Um, and then, you know, I, I do wanna be upfront. It is not, um, I don't love the film. I don't think it's amazing, but, it's really interesting. And I, I, I really, sometimes as a curator, um, will show things I don't like, but because I think it's interesting to talk about what they're trying to do formally. Um, and this one is, is one of those for sure. And there are things that I like about it quite a bit. Um, I mean, the dancers are really strong. I think the choreography is really strong. Um, and the sparseness of the script, I actually really appreciate. Um, but then there's <laughs> there's some other things we can talk about that don't work so well. But um, Deb, I'm curious for you, you know, as a, a dancer, how you felt about the use of, you know, I think we talked a little bit in our prep. This isn't quite a dance film, um, but it obviously is not a musical nor a traditional narrative either. It's really trying to do something that leans on all of those um, genres. And so I'm curious for you how um, you feel about the use of dance in the film. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, 
you know, what's what's lovely about the film is that dance is just another language, you know, that it's not cordoned off from the other aspects of the film as you might see in a traditional kind of dance movie. Or, you know, if you think about the ones that I used to watch over and over in the eighties, like flash dance is that, you know, there are dance scenes that, you know, happen in dance related spaces. And then there are sort of other scenes in which people are doing other things. I like the experimentation with having the dancers act, you know, some are clearly better than others and they almost even acknowledge that, you know, in the, in the very beginning. And they're doing that interesting thing of sometimes showing us the camera, sometimes showing us the boom, you know, trying to um, sometimes addressing us directly to tell us that they're not gonna do a music scene right here or, you know, so they're bringing attention sometimes to the kind of process of making film or the process of thinking film through dance. They don't necessarily follow it through all the way and I'm not even sure what that would um, what that would look like but the movement to me and the choreography and the way dance worked in the film I just felt like was really seamless you know I felt like that actually might happen you know you might end up in a bar and everybody starts doing really I mean I feel like I've had nights like that <laughs> you know everybody starts doing something that feels like a choreography you know, because you're moving together, you're feeling it, you know what I mean? Or you might end up in the park and everybody's just having a good time or, you know, so it felt seamless and I really appreciated that. Yeah. What did you, um, how did you feel about it? Well, I mean, you know, like I said, I thought the um, performances were really strong. I felt like he was doing, the director was doing too much, you yeah. know? Um, so breaking the fourth wall, um, the next thing I wanted to ask you about was sort of this use of the shifts in the actors, um, you know, having these like gender switches, um, the past and present, the, you know, then we even were sort of beyond where there were multiple versions of a character at the same time. Yeah. That started to feel like it was like, it almost seemed like something a first time filmmaker would do and like use all their tricks at once. <laughs> And this director is quite accomplished. Um, and so I, this, it was really tricky to me in that way. Um, I didn't understand why um, we had the shifts in gender. It actually didn't work for me. And so I was curious if you found it useful, but I felt like it was um, kind of a throwaway. Like it didn't add to my understanding of the characters, um, but maybe, maybe I missed something. Huh. Yeah, I'm not sure it added to the understanding of the individual characters, but I did think it was an interesting mechanism through which to think about, um, you know, I guess people would understand it as dualities, you know, and in this case, the obvious is, oh, the masculine, the feminine, but I don't think it always worked like that, you know, so, it, um, you know, for me, it was interesting to track when which aspect appeared and what needed to be done in that moment, why that aspect needed to appear. So when I was confused was when both aspects were there, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I guess on some level, you know, the ideal would be that both aspects are always there and they're always there and in harmony. But at some point I did think, wouldn't it be like super cool if you could send the more emotionally competent version of yourself to go and deal with the situation that you don't want to confront? You know, I thought that would be so useful if that aspect of me had a different body and could just go and deal with it while I did something else, you know? <laughs> but yeah. I kind of felt like, um, you know, it was a puzzle, you know? And, and because I like puzzles, I just kept looking at it and kept thinking, okay, why is she here having this conversation? Why is he here? And really the two that seemed the most compatible were the long haired female version of Eden mm -hmm. and the male bearded version of Aviva. Like the two of them seemed to have a really great relationship even when the other configurations weren't quite working. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually- like for you. 
I liked the female version of Aviva. I think one of the notes I wrote for myself was that I, I did feel like Eden was the least, the male version of him was the um, least compelling, you know, successful performance yeah. <laughs> as an actor. And, that too. and so that was hard. And then the other thing that was bothering me um, were their accents. And I don't know if I'm being too um, hung up on this, um, because I think if they had all had American accents, I wouldn't have been as challenged, which shows my own like imperialist bias. So I think I was really challenged by them not having American nor French accents and then supposed to be in those bodies. Like that was very, that was a little strange for me. And I was trying to like buy it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was thinking through, um, yeah, I was, I was trying to imagine like these different identities um, in these different places, the pressure that's on them. And, you know, just, I don't know, I'm not, I've, I've only lived in the US, you know, for any significant amount of time. So I also don't have any sense of um, what it must be like for people in other countries to watch things, right, with like an American accent and see it as, as local to wherever they are. And so I, I want to acknowledge that bias on my part, but yeah, it was, it was bothering me and oh. I want to get over it, but. <laughs> That's interesting. I guess I didn't even tune into that. You know, for me, both versions of Aviva had some kind of accent that wasn't French, obviously, mm -hmm. which she said up front in the beginning. I am not French, but you know, <laughs> an accent is an accent, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess I didn't really tune into that too much. The other place that the um, shape shifting uh, was interesting to me was when uh, Eden or Eden uh, went out with his friends mm -hmm. um, and they were in the bar and his friend hooked up with somebody mm -hmm. in the bar and how that dance worked mm -hmm. because that was one of the times when I felt like I couldn't identify why she was there. Mm you know, in that moment. And then I had to rethink like, what am I attaching her to? Like what, what aspect am I thinking she's doing? What aspect am I thinking his version of himself is doing, you know? And of course, I think also you must've felt like his, the male version of Eden was like the least compelling character too, you know? Cause he's like- Whiny and- for tantrums. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, you know, that scene I think is when I kind of woke up to the film. Um, I felt like I did appreciate the choreography in the bar. And so I was like, okay, maybe this is going to give me the keys to how this film works. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I really appreciated about that scene was the costuming. Mm -hmm. Because it would have been really easy to dress the characters up in the same clothes, but they didn't do that. They chose to dress them in um, sort of typically feminine or typically masculine ways that sort of related to each other, but not put them in the same garment. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, um, it's to kind of further that uh, if it is a masculine, feminine or split or whatever the split is that they were th themselves, but in this like slightly different body. Um, so I, I really thought that was great, but I'm always attuned to costume um, and and, you know, I don't know if anyone else even noticed, but I, I really, particularly in the bar, I remember um, because the female version had on like, um, you know, a very um, like low, you know, camisole and mm -hmm. the male version was a t-shirt, you know, and they easily could have both had on t-shirts or tank tops even, so. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I was interested too, and I wonder what you thought of this um, in, the ways they both related in different times and different spaces. And it was so, it, this was a spatially specific set of decisions, I think, on the part of the director, how they both related the demise of their previous relationships mm. you know, and what that was about. And this one had to be in the white room and this one was in the loft space, you know, and, and the way that those descriptions, those emotional landscapes unfolded, I thought was um, 
sometimes confusing as to why it was happening then at that particular moment in the action of the film. Um, but I was wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, I mean, I think in large part because those scenes were also danced, if you will, they were more successful <laughs> to me than when they were you know, in dialogue with each other. Um, so I wasn't really questioning um, their placement. Um, I really, really liked the white room sequence, I think, of, of them. Um, and, you know, yeah, there was something about that one. And then there's something also about, so one of the other things, one of the other tricks, I guess, I thought about the airport sequence, mm -hmm. which is in the loft space later, right? Um, and that one felt the most theatrical in terms of what we might see if we saw dance in a theater space. Yeah. And I, I liked that. I appreciated that they went to that sort of um, style um, or mode. I'm not really sure. Like, I don't know how to talk about this, but um, that was really successful to me. And it, again, maybe I'm just wanting them to be dancing all the time, but um, I thought using the loft space, but then having this, I guess they did it a couple of times where there was another, not an airport sequence, but another one when they used that space and mimed basically their way through. Um, what would you say? Where he's driving in LA, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know. I thought of it maybe as like these rooms in their mind, you, mm -hmm. right? So like in the same way that if you did live somewhere with an ex, you kind of literally go there in your brain and not necessarily just the ex, but like who you were, you know, if you were 25 or mm -hmm. I just finished watching um, the Love Life series on HBO Max mm -hmm. and I haven't seen it yet. Um, but it's, it's sort of like 10 episodes in someone's love life in their twenties and thirties. Oh, and <laughs> But it kind of makes me think about this film and, and the way that it relates because it is um, a similar age group um, and it's a uh, each episode is um, a romantic partner um, mostly um, and so just thinking about how those places or behaviors get fixed mm. in time so maybe that's what the function is but I don't really know yeah that's interesting yeah um, we have a question um, given all of the physical sexual interactions between both versions of Eden and Aviva I did not appreciate a true feeling of love between them. They seemed annoyed with each other for a large part of the film. You know, when I felt the most um, kind of frisson between them was when they were dancing at early in the film, when they were dancing without touching, like when they were enacting the, the love at the distance. Yeah. Like that's when it felt the most electric between their bodies, you know, but of course they were actually in different physical spaces. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the tone was set in their first, you know, present encounter for a almost just emotionally combative, intimate relationship that was highly unsatisfying, I think on both sides you know and again i felt that the the most loving um interaction was probably the one between the female uh eden and the male aviva much later in the film almost the breakup sex in a way because they're holding on you know they're trying to hold on to it yeah well i also wonder if that has to do with the acting capacity because annoyance is a little easier to um find <laughs> than i think maybe some of the other I don't, I don't know um there was i had also made a note for myself just since it was brought up in this question um the nudity for me, like I, I, my experience of dancers is that they like being naked. And so I thought it was really great to sort of have that as part of the film because it is not a big deal. It is always something. And also to think about people being like when they meet the, um, I think he was an attorney, like an immigration attorney to even have him be naked. You know, I thought it was like, we're all sort of emotionally vulnerable at some points. And I, I, I thought that was really useful. Yeah, I'm not sure it's that we, we I'll say we as a former dancer, like being naked. I think it's that we like being unencumbered, 
you know, and clothes are that kind of, <laughs> right? It's the veneer of something on the outside, right? But, but there were moments when actually the costumes worked very well to enhance, you know, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and there was a lot of sex. There was. <laughs> But I think for me, um, again, like just to compare it to Love Life, which is I just finished yesterday, so it's fresh on my brain. There was a lot of sex in that too. And I guess for many people in their 20s and 30s, there can be a lot of sex. So I didn't, I felt like it was sort of, you know, given sort of where they were in their life stage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was interesting, again, in thinking through the who shows up when, you know, um, like paying attention to who was in bed when, you know, mm. and who was in, who, when was who able to finish as they put it? And how does that work in terms of satisfaction around those four um, bodies, you know, and like what are the circumstances in which one person is able or not able to sort of be present? Um, in the bed and actually the moments when there were three, again, that was the interesting and sometimes confusing thing when both aspects of one of the characters would show up even in bed, you know, and it's like, huh, okay. So I was thinking that this happens when this person is unable to tune into somebody or when this person just wants, you know, this kind of throwaway thing or, you know, but in fact, when they're both there, it makes you think again about, wait, what are they really saying about this? You know, what is, what am I supposed to take away from this moment? Or, I mean, it, it also seemed at least with Eden that the self made out with each other too, you know what yeah. I mean? Really, yeah. That was interesting. Yeah. And I wasn't sure if that had to do with like, you know, we get this arc for him that he, you know, was watching porn very early. And so I was like, did this have something to do with that? Or I don't know, it was, yeah. it was very, um, a little confusing. Or that he had to reconnect. Like there was so much um, argumentation also between him and the, you know, feminine, feminized, I suppose, version mm -hmm. of him that, you know, like he had to reconnect. He had to connect that back together. Like, and I think that childhood flashback not being able to deal with the fact that all along he thought he was playing with a boy, but it was a girl. Mm -hmm. You know, that constant thing seems like we're supposed to get from that, that he has like a block about gender stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and he's not in tune with whatever his gendered alterities might be. Mm -hmm. And so he has to find ways to reattune himself to, to that. So in, in the end, spoiler, you know, in the end, when he reaches for his female avatar's hand, you know, it seemed to me like, oh, okay, he's trying to, he's trying to, you know, reattach or he's trying to sort of become more whole in his self-understanding. Yeah. I also, it's just occurring to me now, and I guess I'm not sure that it matters, but I like that. Um, and I guess this is just, you know, a lot of the, the Hebrew names are, uh, gender neutral, which yeah. is also true in like my ex-husband's from has, is Shona. And so those Bantu names are also gender neutral. And so I think that makes it easier to hear yeah. the actors refer to themselves in those, you know, in their pairings. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if it would have worked if they had been named, you know, Deborah and Thomas, you yeah. know, like, <laughs> reversed if we would have felt that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I see another question. And actually, this is something that I wanted to um, hear your thoughts on. Uh, the question is from Kristen Winch, who would love to hear our reflections on the Jewish themes that ran uh, throughout. And I also wanted to talk about that because it seems like, um, you know, it's incidental, her being Jewish. Um, and then we get the, uh, you know, pardon the pun, incendiary joke, you know, at the end, um, you know, at which she can fully laugh, you know, and um, that she fully embraces. But where I thought that, okay, maybe it's not incidental what they're doing, what he's doing with this was uh, in her breakup story, 
you know, because that's the moment when we see a kind of um, uh, transformation, right? She talks about the breakup. The breakup was because he became very religious. He became very conservative and she tried, but couldn't do it, mm -hmm. you know? And I was wondering what that was, you know, leading us toward. It didn't seem to um, work itself into the broader kind of structure of the film or the narrative or, you know, though obviously the forms of dance and um, kinds of, you know, quote unquote folk dance that are being drawn upon to do, build the language that's being built is um, Jewish or what we might identify as Jewish and it's Bathsheba. So of course it's going to be Israeli in some form. But I was wondering if they, he was also with that making a kind of veiled anti-Zionist argument mm -hmm. um, or what he was sort of trying to do with that story about the ex, you know, that it was perfect. He was Moroccan, he was Jewish too, he was beautiful. They were in tune with each other, but then he went to extreme and she tried but couldn't go with him. And I was trying to think about why is, why is this in here when this is not when this is not what the film is about, but maybe on some level it is what the film was about. I just couldn't sort of pull it out. What did you? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think I, I would personally sort of make the jump that because he became religious, it means he became, you know, that means he was Zionist necessarily. So I think I over identified maybe a little bit with, um, I grew up quite heathen, I was like to say that. And I love, uh, religion and I have um, tried to be with religious people of different faiths and struggle so hard because I'm still kind of at my core like this heathen person and that's where I thought she was going it was like she couldn't be bound even though she wanted to be with this person so that was kind of what I thought and I I what I that one scene that I'm remembering uh, I feel like Eden was really callous about it, you know? And I think that also showed a split between them because she wasn't saying he became religious and he's a bad person. You know, she was saying he became religious and like that just, we weren't for each other, but you know, Eden was basically like, <laughs> wow. religion, basically, I mean, yeah. it was like really, really challenging. So yeah. I, I, I think <laughs> to the earlier person's question, it didn't seem like they were a match for each other. And that was a, a big flag. Um, yeah. Because even if you were, you know, two sort of secular people, I think your respect or um, appreciation of faith can also split you, even if you don't have any, you know? Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think speaking to uh, the Bathsheba choreography, I loved the wedding sequence. I think that was my favorite, favorite scene. Um, mm. I thought it was done so well and just so beautiful and joyous. And I thought such a great moment to bring in all that choreography. And I think, like you said about the bar, it seemed very natural. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, probable. Yeah, no, I loved that also. And it was such a kind of modernist rendition of the very traditional dance that I'm sure we've all been in at one wedding or another. Um, yeah, I really appreciated that, but um, my preference dance wise is for the the kind of movement vocabulary that we saw in the bar scene and that catch and release and the weight and the the partnering the very difficult partnering to make it look like you're just throwing somebody away or catching somebody or you know that's so hard to make it look so fluid mm -hmm. like that and I love that and I love that about that company you know also so yeah yeah. Um, so I'm just looking at our run of show. Are there any other questions from folks out there? Yeah, I'd love to know what you all, those of you who have seen it already, I know probably some of you will see it after. I'd love to know what uh, your thoughts about this film were, if you have any. You can put them in the chat. Um, you know, I looked up the director just a little bit and I'm, his, his, um, filmography is quite diverse in a way that almost makes no sense. <laughs> the yeah. kinds of things that he's directed and I've seen, um, three of these films and I was really shocked that they're the same person. So, um, 
Fresh. Fresh. This is 1994. I think his um, debut was a feature filmmaker. Um, and that's the one about the kid. And I think he's in Harlem who plays chess or something like that, if I remember. Um, and then 1998 is A Price Above Rubies, which I really enjoyed. That was the one about the Orthodox community um, in Brooklyn. And then Remember the Titans. Yeah, which is an outlier. <laughs> yeah. It's been wild. Yeah, um, that's like, oh my God, I got my big Hollywood break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then there's um, Uptown Girls in 2003, which also just seems like mm -hmm. a stretch. And then I don't know any of these films from 2008 to 2018. So it was just really interesting um, looking at his career trajectory. Yeah. And so is this the first film that, uh, when is the last film that he made prior to Aviva? 2018 is a film called Boarding School. Okay, so not too long ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> e. Pollard says, this felt like the project of a film student. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah well I think that speaks to what you said about using all your tricks you know I mean they could it could have been um you know half an hour shorter but that's also me I have you know a, a 90 minute attention span for any kind of performance or or visual uh feast um generally but I think like some of the extras could have been pared down that would have streamlined like what are what is not in a didactic way but you know what is the through line that we're really supposed to be paying attention to you know what is the real um takeaway and how do these little fringes kind of um pull into them you know pull us back into the main takeaway rather than seeming like there are so many different things happening you know it was odd like I didn't I didn't mind the kid playing in the park scene and the red shoes mm -hmm. um, realization um I mean it seemed almost didactic as a way to say oh, okay he's got issues in some way you know and then of course he watches a lot of porn and draws pictures of big boobs and you know all of that kind of stuff but um but I didn't understand why he had to come back as a kid in the apartment search, you know, or, or why the kids had to do that um, kind of almost West Side Story kind oh, of the pop uh, dance sequence in the yeah, which was great. I mean, it was, it was interesting choreographically, um, but it sort of stepped out of the, the main through line of the film, I thought, you know, it was you know, it was meant, I suppose, to show this kind of Boise camaraderie that he maybe never fully got out of, you know, but um, but it just seemed to take us away from what could have been a, a more clear kind of, not narrative thrust, but a thematic core, you know. I don't know, how did you feel about that particular scene? So I, I still don't understand it. I mean, I was trying mm -hmm. to figure out, um, you know, lots of boys and girls or, you know, now young people would say, you know, gender non-conforming and non-binary folks would be friends with each other as children. Like, I don't, I don't, I, I've never heard of someone realizing that their friend was not who they thought they were, especially as a young child and rejecting them. It wasn't like the kid was trans, you know what I mean? There was no yeah. um, reveal, so to speak. So I, I really didn't understand they were like six or five, you know, and realizing that the other kid was a girl, like I, and, and I feel like we didn't get a reason why um, that that was a, like a site of rejection. I'm not quite sure. Um, well, and she didn't either. She's like, what, you're just gonna go away on your little bike now? <laughs> yeah, like he's, he ruined her life. <laughs> I mean, not that he's responsible as a kid, but I, yeah. yeah. That was a that one was not satisfying for me. I did like when he turned into a little boy with the apartment, only because um, I think we have those moments in our relationship where we return to like brats, and you know, <laughs> being a brat like while be becoming impatient, and you know, um, I you know I think about the uh, sort of scenes of domesticity, like looking for an apartment, or you know, when your family's coming over for dinner and when we return to these moments that um, we're at our brattiest. And so that re actually worked really well for me because I think about partners that I've had and I feel like they're my son in this moment or not, you know, I just, I don't know. I, That's I like what happens when your family's coming over for dinner. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs>
<laughs> but what about the scene with the boys, the West Side Story scene the, with the boys like being, you know, we're from New York, like you can't tell us anything. And then the little choreography. Yeah, I mean, similarly, I thought it was fun, but it didn't feel at all necessary. It totally could have been cut and it yeah. didn't, it didn't provide any insight into uh, uh -huh. who he was. Yeah. Um, there's a, uh, from Kristen, did you interpret the childhood scene with Aviva and the three boys in the alley as a rape scene? Yeah, I thought a long time about that. I was, I was trying to, I was trying to figure out what that was supposed to be. Even if I didn't know what actually happened after the camera moved away. Mm -hmm. And I thought that it, I thought, and I want to know what you thought, but I thought that ultimately it wasn't. I thought it was that thing where the boy shows you what you what they've got, and you're like, "Ew," and like walk away. Or you know, I thought that that's what Aviva would have done. Like she would have been like, "Who cares about that thing?" and like left or something. I don't know. What did you think, Mary? I, I didn't know. I mean, I honestly was sort of uh, wanting them to return to it, you know, because I wasn't sure what happened. Um, I did feel like it must be some kind of indication of assault, not necessarily rape, but maybe, you know, she had been forced to kiss one of them or, you know, I don't know what happened, but it, it seemed to be in a point where we were getting to know some of her like backstory and it being traumatic because I also feel like that came when we saw her sort of being ignored by her parents. And so I thought we were getting some of the reasons why she's, you know, wired the way that she is. So I thought it did indicate some kind of um, infraction, but not, so I didn't. Ignored by her parents because of the baby? Yeah, but it felt like we were seeing that. I didn't think about him being a boy. It just seemed like whatever we were being shown on the screen to me was to let us sort of feel like she was being overlooked. Huh. But that's how I interpret it. <laughs> Maybe I'm telling you about my own. <laughs> So now we know that your partners get bratty when you're preparing for your family to come <laughs> over. <laughs> yeah, no, I thought, um, yeah, I, I, uh, that was another scene I didn't really know what to make of because at first I thought, oh yeah, this is the competition for parents' affection. You know, they're paying all this attention to the baby. But then the dad, you know, picked her up and started dancing with her around the room naked, which that, that moment of nakedity was a little odd to me, you know, but okay, hey, you know, they're French. <laughs> but, um, so, so then I thought, but then she has that lovely moment, you know, of being twirled around. But um, only because the mother said that she couldn't shake the baby. So she was like. Yeah, yeah. But she's sobbing on her mother's lap later when the relationship falls apart. So obviously she's there for her, at least as an adult. Yeah. Yeah, and it did. The, uh, Kristen is saying it seemed like it was followed by so many sexual encounters with so many different men. And I was trying to make some sense of that too. Like, are we to understand this as like some psychological thing of having to just consume it all because of this early moment that must have also disassociated her in some way, the way that Eden's moment disassociated him? But I wasn't, I wasn't sure. I was trying not to, trying not to read that psychologically in that way, um, you know, and in, uh, uh, so like I was trying hard to not be like, oh, she's just throwing herself at all of these guys because of some trauma. I was trying to think, well, what if she just really is finding a lot of pleasure, you know, and that's okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I try not to read things that way, so I didn't. <laughs> Yeah, because I think that people have many kinds of reaction to trauma and that sort of feels like such a puritanical <laughs> way to sort of do that. So I didn't either. Um, but we have another. Um, can you speak more about the role of gender in the film? Did you feel that they were actually changing genders or just each character's expression of their masculinity or femininity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did you think about that? Mary? Yeah, I mean, I think we spoke a lot to this in the beginning, so I'm not sure I have anything to add, but I guess if I had to sort of um, pronounce it, um, I think that it was a duality. I don't know, like you said, if it was 
feminine and masculine, but it was sort of our like right and left brain or, you know, I think in Islam, you know, that you think about like having an angel on your left and your right. And so, you know, that we all have this duality within us. Um, and actually, I feel like some of my millennial friends would say that it's a multi, it's more, it's poly. It's, it's not two, it's poly. Right. <laughs> it's many, many. Um, but yeah, I, I felt like they were two sides. And I think it's um, interesting physically to see that in masculine and feminine and in male and female bodies. Um, but I don't, I, even if we were to say it was masculinity and femininity, I don't even know that that's gendered either, right? Like, I think it was just sort of the different kinds of dualities that we have within us. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking a little bit after I saw it the first time about um, what if it weren't, what if this um, multiplicity wasn't represented through gender, but had been represented through something else? Like, what if it had been represented through race? Mm. Like, how would we have read that or and then how would that have even worked i mean there's so that would have almost made the multiplicity more possible you know to think through different physical expressions you know um you know what if because i think we're so uh, not the millennials but many of us are so uh socialized into that particular duality being the foundational duality and being an actual duality you know, there's a feminine thing, there's a masculine thing, there's this side of you, there's that side of you. Maybe they integrate, but there are things that this side definitively has and things that this side definitively has. And, you know, and then maybe they merged a bit, you know, but I think that's the one that people have the hardest time with. And, the, and it's also the duality that's sort of the most foundational to, or, you know, in conjunction with race, I would say the most foundational to inequality, mostly because you can see it as a duality or you think you can see it as a duality, you know? And so I, that's why I was trying to imagine it as some other kind of expression. Mm -hmm. uh, like what if we weren't looking at bodies that we think we can recognize as either men or women or male or female. And instead we were looking at something else, some other, kind of representation of these multiple aspects of our personalities. And I think that would probably be a harder, you know, film to shoot, you know, and a harder through line to really maintain. But in a way it might be more interesting, you know, <laughs> because it would raise so many other questions, you know, because yeah. it's easy to say, oh, that's his female self. Right you know, but maybe it's just in, infinitely more complex than that too, you know, and I think it is. Well, I think that Eden's two selves looked like each other. So that was a little easier to hold on to. Mm. Aviva, they did not necessarily look like each other. I think if they had cast like a redheaded um, male mm. side, I think maybe I would have held on to that too. But it does seem like the story is somewhat about gender. Um, particularly going back to the scene with the two kids, because what it was so powerful about that one is, you know, they had the same haircut, yeah. <laughs> you know, they had on the same clothes, yeah. which is what kids do, you know? And so I think that was interesting um, that we have that as this point of rupture because, you know, kids kind of wear the same clothes, you know, unless they're, you know, me, <laughs> you know, like I was committed to wearing dresses because my mother wanted to dress me in gender uh -huh. Um, but so I think about like, I loved that they had the longer hair because yeah. it was so, such a, yeah, they could be anything as kids, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's true. Looking at them, you wouldn't have known until they zoomed in on the shoes that they were not the same gender or that they were opposite genders in the way we think about oppositionality, you know? Um, yeah, it's true. That was, that was a, a nice tactic, yeah. Yeah. And they didn't do much with, you know, speaking of race, they didn't do much with um, her boyfriend at the end, you know. Um, and, you know, they, they wouldn't have had to, like, we see that um, she finally finds somebody who just like, is so, I mean, that I think you felt, and he's one of the dancers also, but like his when he says she's my heart or when he is just really introducing her as the girlfriend, like you felt that, like that was like real, you know, that felt really 
real. And then, you know, he was making the kind of ethnic historical jokes, you know, but we never sort of saw it from the other side. And I was kind of wondering about that a little bit too. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I think we've <laughs> maybe exhausted all we can with um, talking about this film. Um, I, yeah, I, I just was really curious about it. I, um, as a, a filmmaker, I'm always sort of, and, and, you know, programmer and curator, always thinking about how we play with form and how we push up against um, genre and, you know, all of the structures. And I think, um, I don't think this was successful, but I appreciate that they tried. And I think the things that worked were really, really great. Um, and so, you know, I hope that um, those of you who saw it this evening um, also enjoyed some of it or all of it. Um, I don't know about you. If you want to have any closing thoughts? Any closing thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I think as a if if one is attuned to the dance part of it as a dance film, it's a very enjoyable experience because the dance is beautiful and it's just it's so well integrated and it's just. Um, it's playful and it makes you feel alive, you know, and I really, I really like that. I agree. I mean, I think as a whole, obviously it's had us talking, you know, and it had us thinking about some of these issues. So it's provocative in that way, but it doesn't quite come together in the end, but I appreciate having been able to see it and really have enjoyed having this discussion with you about it. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank the Annenberg Center for hosting us in this conversation. And thank you so much, Deb, for joining me. Um, thank you to all of you who've chosen to be here with us this evening. Um, and there is a reminder that uh, you have access to watch the film through November 19th. Your original link will still view, um, your original link will still work to view the film. Um, also wanted to make sure that you know, let me see where we have this. Um, to learn about additional programming, um, visit alumni.upenn.edu forward slash homecoming. Um, and then there will be some more film programs um, this semester and next, we're working on that. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of um, Annenberg Center's um, returning a film, which was part of the original um, focus of the center, uh, part of the original mission of the center. So I'm really excited to be a part of bringing that back um, and having this opportunity to engage with the larger Penn community. Um, so thank you so much for joining us to celebrate um, the 12th year of arts and culture at homecoming. Have a good night. Have a good night. <laughs>